Good afternoon. It's a pleasure and an, on an honor to be the chair of the closing ceremony of this event. The team, as you know, is yes, we can. With a question mark. In a time of unprecedented demands of pertinent, relevant, and potent input from social science, can they, us, can we deliver? We have three speakers. For each one, we have 15 minutes. And at the end, we'll have a musical farewell under responsibility of Annalise, chair of local organizing committee. So in the end of the third speaker, we have 10 minutes more, very grateful of music of farewell of this event. So let's begin with the first speaker, Adam Mohammed Habib, Deputy Vice, Vice Chancellor, Research, Innovation and Advancement, University of Johannesburg, South Africa, with the subject, Advanced in Social Science that Make a Difference, Understanding Context and Problematizing and Application of Knowledge. Your 15 minutes, please. Well, ladies and gentlemen, friends, colleagues, it's really a great pleasure uh, to have this opportunity to speak uh, in the concluding sh uh, section. Let me thank the organizers. It's uh, uh, a wonderful opportunity after a two-day conference. Uh, you know, there's been, obviously, like many, most of the speakers in the last two days, I concur that the social sciences is absolutely necessary uh, for addressing many of the problems that we confront uh, of our day. Uh, but I don't want to focus on that because everybody, a number of people, the earlier panel on, on climate change made this point. Yesterday's plenary panel on the AIDS uh, subject made the point and a number of other panels. So I don't want to really focus on that. Rather, in the few minutes I have, I want to focus on a different problematic. And I want to focus on the issue of how do we apply knowledge uh, in our different contexts. And specifically, I want to actually deal with and address two problems. The first that I want to address is that why in so many cases around the world do we have a situation where we know what policies should be applied? Or at least we know what policies should not be applied. And yet, those are the very policies that do get applied. That in direct contradiction to what we know, there are sets of policies that get applied. And there was an interesting number of examples of this. Yesterday's plenary panel on AIDS drew out two examples of this. The one was uh, the insistence by the Bush regime in the United States to use abstinence as the defining uh, criteria for the interventionist agenda and the AIDS struggle. Uh, and secondly, the case uh, in my own country of the denialist stance uh, that Thabo Mbeki did. And the big question that emerged in both those cases is why were political elites in both cases able to get away with applying policy that went against the grain of existing knowledge in the social science community. And it seems to me that we've heard a little bit of this, but we haven't heard sufficiently. The answer to that is power. That actually, they were able to get away with this because the recipients of that aid were African citizens who were powerless. That powerless meant they became the subject to the diktats of, of political elites, and the only time that this was changed was either when the political regime in the United States was ousted, as was the, political, the president in South Africa, uh, or when the social movement was mobilized, like the treatment action campaign in South Africa, which had a dramatic impact on changing the policy agenda. So it seems to me that power is at the heart both of the application of good policy, and powerlessness is at the heart of the application of bad policy. And it's something that we need to clearly interrogate. I'll give you a second example of this. Uh, again, it was raised uh, in a different panel. In the governance and development panel yesterday, uh, there was a fascinating debate and reflection 
uh, by Ibrima Sal, who's the General Secretary of Cadestria. And what Ibrima said was one of the big concerns is the, the, the topic was the dev devastating effects of structural adjustment on African economies. And what Ibrima said was, look, we knew that these structural adjustment policies were going to have an adverse effect. In fact, there were a whole range of African intellectuals, but also other intellectuals, who were saying this even before these structural adjustment policies were implemented. What happened? Those policies were implemented. Why? Because these African intellectuals were powerless. That actually structural adjustments progra uh, programs suited beneficiaries, political elites in northern societies, and that's where the power was located, and that's how you were able to advance and you saw structural adjustment policies. Now, in this new context, you're hearing the emergence, the need for the emergence of a developmentalist agenda. You're hearing a whole range of progressive economists and scholars, liberal scholars and, uh, from all over the world looking at the Western European experience, looking at Southeast Asia and saying what we need is something like a developmentalist state. We need to advance a developmentalist state. But what these analysts often forget or don't factor into account is that these developmentalist states were a product of particular configurations of power in those societies that you can't understand the emergence yesterday in that same panel on development, there was the discussion of wage compression in Scandinavian countries in the, in the period post the Second World War. And the argument is you couldn't understand that development trajectory without understanding the power of labor in Scandinavian societies in this period. That you couldn't understand the, the emergence of the development state in places like Japan and South Korea and Taiwan if you didn't understand the issue of the Cold War and the leverage that the Cold War gave to state elites in these societies. So power was again central, it seems to me, to the problematic of applying knowledge. And we forget that, if we forget this, we will never be able to advance the social science that makes the difference. So that, it seems to me, was the first big comment I wanted to make with regards uh, to my concluding reflections. The second problem I want to identify in the application of knowledge is emanates from within the social science community itself. And really what it does is it pertains to the methodologies we employ to understand, explain phenomena, and then apply these lessons elsewhere. One of the most positive developments in the social sciences over the last two and three decades is the growth of comparative studies. Because what comparative studies has enabled is the development of conceptual tools, not only to explain, but also to understand lessons and how these are applied. But there has been a danger, because for many, context in the applications of comparative lessons has been forgotten. The issue of context gets forgotten. Again, one of the most powerful phrases that emerged in these two days, I think, was also in the governance and development panel. And again, it was a colleague who spoke about Scandinavian countries and the experience of Scandinavian countries. And he says, learning does not mean imitation. Learning does not mean imitation. But for many of our scholars, particularly in the policy field, learning has precisely become to mean imitation. And Sam Moyo say, uh, said, made the point, not only imitation, also imposition. And that's something that I think we need to be very, very concerned about. And I want to give you some examples of this as well. One of the areas that I work in is in democratization studies in transitional societies. And if you look at the work done in two to three decades of work on this, uh, on this subject, one of the central messages coming out of the mainstream literature was that actually procedural democracy, getting the institutions of democracy working, is absolutely crucial. But what is also coming out is issues of socioeconomic justice must be postponed because if you raise issues of socioeconomic justice, what will happen is that down the line, it will compromise, it will fundamentally compromise the emergence of procedural democracy. And again, this thing was parroted out by these democracy pundits that came out from parts of the United States, the World Bank, and other parts of uh, Europe, and, and it went around, and this was a kind of policy prescription. And it had devastating consequences. Because, because it was applied in these societies, it fundamentally eroded the foundation of democracy itself. One of the most tragic examples, and I'm going to give you deliberately a controversial example, one of the most tragic examples of this is Zimbabwe. Because the problem of Zimbabwe is that land 
and inequality in land ownership was fundamentally ignored at the dawn of its transition. And what happened as a result is 15, 20 years later, what happened is it allowed an aging autocrat to utilize this issue and manipulate it to undermine the democratic foundations of, of, of Zimbabwean society. Now, one of the things that gets forgotten in this debate is not simply if you listen to the contemporary debate on Zimbabwe, you hear about the issues of, of civil liberties, you hear about the rights of citizens, which I think are absolutely crucial and should be at the forefront, but you, you don't hear enough about the issue of systemic reform, about how do we fundamentally transform the structural conditions, the abandonment of issues of justice that created the problem in the first place. And that's something that I think we should be very, very concerned about. There's a second example I will give you. Again, it emerged in the plenary pa pa panel yesterday on AIDS. And what was suggested, which I agree with, is one of the most powerful breakthroughs in the fight against AIDS was the development of ARVs, which changed the scourge from a death sentence to a serious, serious illness. But then Bio, who was the discussant at that, at that panel, made the point that it only becomes, gets converted from a death sentence to a serious illness if you have the delivery mechanisms to actually make the ARVs available to the citizens. Well, if you start speaking in large parts of the developing world, one of the biggest dilemmas we have is that the public service, the public health system, has been completely collapsing. And it's collapsed because of underinvestment in infrastructure, and it's collapsed in part because of the brain drain that has emanated from these societies to Western Europe, the United States, and even South Africa at that point. And it seems to me that if you want to find the application of social science knowledge, if you want to apply it in a particular context, then context becomes important. You have to take into account the quality of the public infrastructure. You have to take into account how do we deal with the brain drain. And fundamentally, the simple task of the provision of ARVs means that we also got to start talking about the conditionalities that are imposed on African states by the international financial institutions. You've got to raise, right, how do we deal with the collective problem of the brain drain that has become part of our contemporary reality? Again, a, sim a, a major question, context is important. And I want to, in my last two or three minutes, use a third quick example, which I think is also controversial, but I think it's important to, to raise the debate. And that is the issue of nuclear nonproliferation. Now, one of the things that fascinates me is that on the nuclear nonproliferation issue, the big thing that confronts political elites in the West more generally, but also in other parts of the world, is the issue of how to prevent Iran and North Korea from getting the nuclear bomb. And what all of them are very concerned about, and they're befuddled by, is why is it that the majority of citizens in Iran actually support their state getting a nuclear weapon? What they can't understand is why is it there's a group of nationalists in many parts of the developing world that are fundamentally open to the idea of getting a nuclear weapon. We have had more powers go nuclear in the NNPT in the last 15, 16 years than at any other period in time. The Indians, the Pakistanis, you've got Israel, you had South Africa at an earlier period, etc. On that score, I mean, there's a lot of talk about South Africa having given up its nuclear weapons as, a, as, as really a fantastic example of human rights. Let me remind you, it happened in the last days of the apartheid state collapsing. And the reason we gave it up, to be honest, was because the political elite, a race, a white political elite suddenly found the thought, we're going to have a black man with his finger on a nuclear weapon. And they suddenly quick. So we got rid of nuclear weapons because of racism, not because of some magnanimous commitment to human rights. So the point I want to make here, however, is that if you want to understand and apply and find solutions to the nuclear nonproliferation problem, then the real issue is how do we resolve this? Well, the first thing you're going to have to do is in the nuclear nonproliferation, uh, there's a profound contradiction. It's an unequal agreement. It says people who have nuclear weapons, in some future date we'll decommission, but those who don't have it, well, you can't get it. It's a profoundly, it sticks in the craw of nationalists in the developing world. Secondly, you've got Iran that just had its neighbor invaded by a major superpower. It now has serious security concerns. 
if you don't address those security concerns, if you don't address the quality of the nature of inequality in the nuclear non-proliferation treaty, you'll never arrive at a situation where you find and stop the proliferation of nuclear weapons. So context, again, is very, very important. And this is what I wanted to end off with. It seems to be we need to understand context. Now, that's not to suggest that comparative lessons is, shouldn't be done. I think it's very, very important. I do not believe in a country exceptionalism or a cultural exceptionalism. But the lesson must be applied by understanding context and its consequences. And if you remember, 130 years ago, you had uh, Karl Marx say in the 18 Brumaire, Karl Marx say in the 18 Brumaire, I can't recall the phrase entirely, the maxim, but men make history, but they never make it as they please. They do not make it under circumstances chosen by themselves, but are under circumstances found and transmitted from the past. What that maxim speaks to is the issue of power. What that maxim speaks to is the issue of context. We have read it countless of times, but have we truly internalized it? Because if we don't internalize it, you'll never advance a social science that makes a difference. I thank you. Thanks, Mr. Mohammed Habib, for intervention. Now, Michel Vivorca, President of International Sociological Association and Professor at École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales, Paris, France. So, so, social science are not in crisis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for those that organize this wonderful uh, meeting. The world is in crisis, but social sciences are not in a crisis. This is what I want to say, and at the end of such a forum, I think it's, it's, a, it's a necessity. I would like to start with what was the classical era of the social sciences, an era that, from my point of view, finished in the late 60s or early 70s. <laughs> there were some basic principles for research at that time. The first main principle consisted in the study of social problems, social facts, or social action within the framework of the nation state. The idea was that society was in a strong correspondence with the state and with the nation. Of course, all sociologists or all social scientists were not thinking like that, but most of them were thinking like that. And if some social scientists wanted to work on more general uh, problems, there are two ways to do the comparative approaches, as you said just before, and that means that you study the same social problem or the same social action or the same social facts in different countries or the study of the so-called international relations. The second main principle at least for a French sociologist, excuse me, was to explain the social by the social. There is a very famous formula by Emile Durkheim that says that. That means that you, don't, you cannot accept any explanation if you want to deal with so the social. You cannot any accept any causality, any determinism that would not be social. You cannot have God, we cannot have the nature that will explain what you are dealing with. And this was very important because this meant a rather strict separation between the social sciences and, some people say, the hard sciences or the natural sciences, real sciences. Today, we are taking some distance with what Ulrich Beck, a German sociologist, called methodological nationalism we more and more think global. That is to say, we study problems or action or facts, trying to articulate various levels, including the world level, regional levels, the national, the local. We try to think global and not within the only framework of the nation state. Of course, this framework does not disappear, but it is not the only one. Today, we don't dis we don't separate so totally nature and culture and social. We know that many explanations that naturalize facts or problems are in fact an, one ideology, and that what we call natural is sometimes 
cultural or social. And we also know that it is more and more important to work in an interdisciplinary way, not only within the social sciences, but within all disciplines, including the hard sciences. In this morning today, we had a wonderful illustration with uh, climate uh, change uh, debate. I want to give some illustrations of what I've been saying. If you take some great problems of the contemporary world for social scientists, they are to be studied at the, uh, globally. If you take the American crisis, it is American at the beginning, subprimes, so credit, and so on, but very quickly, very suddenly, it becomes a world crisis. If you take terrorism, when I studied terrorism 20 or 30 years ago, it was considered as either a national issue, either as an international issue, either as a domestic issue. Today, terrorism is global. And it may mean, in some extreme cases, that actors are uh, acting at the level of the world. The people that did the 9-11 uh, terrorist attack did not have any roots local or national. They were coming from somewhere and acting in the United States. Their space, their world, was the world and maybe more. If you take religion, not only they are global, which is not totally new, Catholicism has been a global religion very early, but there is a very important phenomenon of deterritorialization. That is to say, religions today uh, are <coughs> developing in countries where they were not born which is very different than when a, a religion de develops itself in a country uh, w where it appeared. If you take all these issues related to climate change, environment, natural catastrophes, pollution, epidemic, pandemic, we have one at, that, at the present moment. We know, we know that everything is not natural in these uh, problems. We know that it has a lot to do with our conceptions of production and consumption our conception of mobility, transportation, health, education, and so on. I just take one example, Katrina. If, if I think about Katrina, my first idea is if the government in the, in the administration, the American administration, had seriously dealt with the problems of, uh, of uh, the river and uh, dams and so on, it would not have been like that. And I also immediately think, well, it's black people that suffered much more than white people, and it's poor people much more than rich people. It is not only natural, and we could imagine many, many other uh, examples. Another point which is very important here is that <coughs> the, the problems that social sciences studied today are much more diverse than in the past. Not only we deal with elements that are that were natural and that, in fact, are not so much natural. But we studied new problems, and we studied them taking always uh, in, uh, in, into account the media. Today, we know that most of the problems that we are dealing with are perceived through the media. And that is to say, even if they look like natural, we know that they are not only natural, and that there are a kind of uh, transformation of what is at stake due to the media. Problems are partly mediatic uh, inventions, which is a very important point. And so there are many new objects for, for us. For instance, in the past, uh, there was a strong uh, uh, interest for rather massive phenomenon. People like to try and find regularities to build maybe sometimes uh, laws or at least the statistic uh, uh, images of phenomena. Today, some people are working on very, very extreme or limited uh, phenomena. Uh, I just give one example. Today, social scientists have a strong interest for cruelty. Cruelty is a very limited aspect of violence, but maybe one of the more important or the more interesting ones. And if I take a certain number of problems that we deal with, I understand that, of course, we don't we try to explain the social by the social, but not, not, not only or not necessarily. We are always trying to work with other uh, disciplines, not only scientific, but for instance with philosophy, with ethic uh, 
uh, ethical uh, specialist. I have some friends working in hospitals as sociologists dealing with ethical issues. What do you do in some very heavy circumstances when, you have, when people have to decide on death and life? Sociologists have something to say, and of course, what they have to say is not only purely uh, sociologists. So, I don't want to take too much time, so I will come to my last idea before my conclusion. My last idea is that sometimes there are parallelism. Sometimes I have a different geometric image, which is not parallelism, but convergence. But it's the same idea, so my mathematical knowledge is not so solid. But <laughs> convergence or parallelism, you can, you can choose. So my idea, what I see is that there is some parallelism in what the social, the hard sciences do and what social science do on some objects. For instance, today there is a strong interest for biodiversity on the one hand and for cultural or social diversity. And today, and this, it's this more or less the same way of thinking, the real science and the social science, to say it like that, are agree there is no a one best way. We, don't, we share the same rupture with evolutionism. Sometimes also it becomes clear that the problem is not only to work together in, uh, in an interdisciplinary uh, manner. Uh, and, and sometimes also it is clear that working on each side is not sufficient. i just give one example. Um, Many years ago, scientists, geneticians, <coughs> population geneticians demonstrated that the distance between two so-called human races is more or less genetically the same than the distance be between two individuals belonging to a so-called race, which means that racism is stupid because there is no scientific uh, reason to accept it. This is a demonstration by geneticians. But of course, this does not mean that racism will disappear because some scientists demonstrated that it is uh, not scientifically uh, grounded. What is necessary in order to transform uh, scientific knowledge is intervention of social scientists, but also, and this was raised today in the morning, it was very interesting, the intervention of people from the media, the intervention of NGO, Martinelli said a few words about that, the intervention also of politicians, governmental um, uh, servants, and so on, which means that today we know more and more that interdisciplinarity is not only between the social science and other sciences, but also is, means working with a great number of uh, actors to produce knowledge. And this is clearly established if you look at a certain number of social movements. In many social movements today, you have a participation of not only social actors, but also, or activists, but also scientists, but also uh, people that have some expertise, and, and, and so on. So my idea is that in the future, there will be more and more interdisciplinary uh, activities, and this will be very good for the social science as well as for the real science. It will be very good for us, I will tell you why. Because when you work with a real scientist, they oblige you not to be too relativist. They oblige you to not to forget universalism. And it is good also for, such, for the uh, real scientists because they, uh, they find working with that, that us that uh, it is not enough to be naive and to believe that when you demonstrate something, it will change the world. You need mediations, you mean intermediations. So I am not far from my conclusion. Uh, I want to say, I want to say that in the past, in the past, many social scientists uh, have been associated with evil or with dirty mm, behaviors. That uh, in the past, colonialism, imperialism, uh, totalitarianism, and so on, have always received some help from some social scientists. We must not forget this. And this means that some say this, the, the consequences of this has been that for many say, social scientists, the idea is we must be far from politics. F politics means helping dirty actors. It's dangerous. And there has been a, a strong tendency not to have any contact with the real life, to say it like that. I think that this is finished. And what I have been describing 
mean, means also not only meeting during different sciences, not only meeting with politicians, but being part of the public debate, of uh, the citizenship debate, uh, of the democratic uh, life. And this means, but I have no time to, 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 to develop this point, this means that social scientists and other scientists don't have exactly the same role in this participation. We must not imagine that we just have to discuss social scientists and other scientists. No, the problem is that we, what we are bringing is not um, the same as what they are bringing, and so it's not so easy to imagine what will be the cooperation in the future. So my conclusion, every 10 or 20 or 30 years, you will find a big book explaining that there is a crisis in the social science or a crisis in such or such discipline of the social science. As a sociologist, I remember having Goodner in the early 70s writing a book about the crisis of Western sociology, and 20 years after, another American sociologist, Evan Horowitz, speaking of a decomposition of sociology, because he was uh, in facing the tendencies of fragmentation of its discipline. But in fact, the crisis of functionalism opened the way to many other ways of thinking. And it is true <coughs> that today there is a development of cultural def differences that could maybe lead to fragmentation for sociology, but not necessarily. And what I want to say is my last sentence, is that the world is changing. Sometimes we call this change a crisis, but in this crisis, as I tried to say with a certain number of examples, in this crisis, we are not part of the crisis. We are changing. We are modifying our ways of approaches. We are modifying our relationship with other scientists, with maybe the political uh, system. We are modifying also the kind of objects that we are dealing with, and we are able to face the future. This is why I want to thank you again for this uh, forum. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Mr. Vivorka. Merci bien. And now the third intervention. Barrett Olson, member of Interim Scientific Advisory Board of UNESCO Forum on Higher Education, Research, and Knowledge. And for us, Claxo, and I'm sure for Codesia and Apisa, unforgettable former director of CIDA and SAREC <laughs> for 10 years. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of you that you are still staying on. And thank you for giving me 15 minutes at this late stage of the day. Um, I, I've seen that most of you are awake. And I would have slept having followed all these speeches all day unless I had to stand here. And I have to keep awake for the last next fifth minutes, obviously. It's actually quite a privilege to be the last, because there are chances that you will remember what I am trying to say. And as you can see on the wall, I am talking about a problem that I think is quite profound. But I will make a very simple presentation. And I will try to address the question given to us, the question mark. Is it possible for social science to deliver? And I have picked up impressions during many of the presentations as well as concerns expressed by the UNESCO Forum on Higher Education, Research and Knowledge that had a workshop in March that actually looked at research in diverse social contexts. And the concern of that forum is not social science in general, but indeed the situation in low and mid-income countries. The forum has uh, initialized studies that were presented partly here during this meeting looking at the situation for sciences and social sciences, both together for research. Um, and it's quite alarming what you see in low-income countries. Many of those are in sub-Saharan Africa. And I remember a colleague, a dear colleague in Kenya, who once said, Africa has to think herself out of her predicaments. And I'd like to emphasize think, and I would like to emphasize herself. But if you don't have a vibrant and sustainable research community, a, a community of scholars that are able to actually do these things that I'm putting on my slide, how can you then really have scholars that are thinking yourself out of predicaments? Um, 
there is no strategy also for developing research in many countries. So it's a profound problem. It's a simple, simple question, but a profound problem. So the answer to the question may be a very careful, yes, we might, or yes, we could. But this requires that conditions for research actually do change and improve. We have talked a lot about conditions for using research here and put a lot of obligations onto the scholars to explain and communicate findings. But also the conditions for producing research are at stake in many low-income countries, as we have seen. When we talk about conditions for using research, you need to be able to link with research community in able to use research. And if you don't have much of a research community around, very many of the informal contacts are those that politicians rely on. They want to turn to people, not to publications. Uh, politicians don't read on the internet and find their way themselves. They need to have interlocutors that are actually sort of translating what's there. So the ability to act with the research community is a capacity issue for communities, but it's also a question of openness. Are, are politicians really willing to listen to critical reflections and debate? And are they willing to fund it? The conditions for producing research also differ across the globe. And if enlightenment is something that researchers can contribute to, it's very sad to see that the globe has sun shining on one side and something rather dark on the other side, and it's, and it's not revolving. It's not, we are not taking turns being enlightened. There is a little bit of a permanent darkness in some parts of the world when it comes to having conditions for proper critical quality research. Academic freedom, of course, is what I talked about a little bit before, but it's much worse than that. I'm talking about the failure to have the basic conditions for research in place. The failure to have disciplines, to have biology, to have statistics, to have behavioral sciences, and all the things you need to have to have research. Which are the basic conditions to have a vital and critical and quality research community. First of all, you need the, the skilled people. And I think that there are very many qualified people from and in low-income countries. But the homes for research are not there. The, the institutions that can really retain people and fund them are not there. The scientific tools may be missing if you don't have a research community. The facilities. And I don't think that there is a research community unless researchers can actually produce and pursue their own ideas and be funded for that. And where are the research councils in low-income countries that are funding and granting project money, which is not designated, but actually open to the ideas of the scientists and researchers and scholars? So to seek funding independently and to be able to implement and publish, we have also heard about that as a caveat for people from low-income countries. So you need the qualified researchers on board and all those uh, conditions, as I said. But then we have a situation which has been much talked about during this conference, where most research that is being funded in sub-Saharan Africa, for instance, is commissioned studies where people have already decided what the studies should concern. Uh, many have to get funded through consultancies, it's not bad in itself. It's bad because it may be the only way to get funded. And if the only way to get money is to engage in collaboration with somebody from outside who really wants what she or he wants to do, you are really uh, not being able to pursue your own lines of thoughts. And I think all countries, low-income countries, mid-income countries, and high-income countries, need to have a proper basis for advanced reflection, for, both for problem solving and for critical analysis and for the enlightenment that you have talked so much about during these days. And, and you can say, why all countries? Couldn't some that are good, like you people that are here, do the research for others? Yes, you could, but you need the situated perspectives. You need the articulated social science findings and observations from the parts of the world where most people live. And these are the areas which are comparatively dark when it comes to having enlightened research institutes and institutions. And as for the countries themselves, why, why, why should the low-income country actually invest in a research community? Couldn't 
they just take on board all the findings that everybody else is producing? I think yes. Sweden uses a lot of research findings from outside. Actually, we only have 1% of the world patents produced in Sweden. But why can we use all those other patents and all these other findings? Well, it's because we have a vital, well-funded, energetic, and able research community. Otherwise, all that would have been a secret to us, I think. There is a commitment. I'm talking mostly about Africa, since I'm a little bit familiar with that. Uh, there is a new push for investing in R&D, and it's clear that heads of states are committed to invest in research and having a research community. But this is very easy to say. It's very difficult to do it. And there are lots of factors against the simple principles of funding a research community. The enormous expansion of higher education dilutes academic capacity. Many countries have lots of so-called research institutes, but they have the walls and some people and a driver and then maybe an exchange operators, but no funds for actually doing research. So that means that all those institutes are not constitute a critical mass. They cannot create a really good um, uh, substance. And the funding, I've touched upon that. How is the research funding? Many countries do not have budget lines for research. They fund research as part of line ministries that are interested in very immediate returns of investments. Um, by September, you should have the answers if you start now. And this is not really qualified research. Uh, most agencies and ministries are interested in applied research. And who are willing to fund the biology, the statistic, the behavioral sciences, and all the basis, all those basic scientific tools you need to be able to address multidisciplinarity and, and multidisciplinary projects. So research cooperation as well is always problem oriented. And the international research programs, of course, have their set agenda, uh, be it WHO tropical diseases or the CGR in agriculture or uh, even the social sciences, uh, the United Nations Institute for, for Research on Social Sciences. Of course, they set an agenda. They are vertical programs. So people are saying, yes, the research funding in low-income countries comes from aid or from charities or NGOs or external agencies. And, and why, would, why would aid fund research? Well, I come from an aid agency, so I know that uh, they need policy advice, so they fund researchers in home countries. Uh, research cooperation uh, in neglected research areas is very often funded. And we talk about supporting research in and by low-income countries. But the balance is tilting. We do much more research on and for countries and very little support for the really vital research communities that can do research in and by the countries themselves. The external research funding is primarily def defining research topics. They talk about, we talk about capacity enhancement, but it's usually a secondary phenomenon. We hope that will rub off if we do research cooperation, something will happen. But in fact, very little of the aid money ends up in low-income countries, very little. And I think it's shameful to be standing here representing aid agencies and having such a view. And I think you all know, if you are working in research institutions, that sustained capacity will not be uh, had if you only have fragmented funding, if you don't have core funding. Everybody knows that. Now, aid has realized that fragmented funding does not produce proper strategies and, and, and whole approaches. And we have talked a lot about that during these days. So ownership has been talked a lot about. First you take it away and now you want to give it back. But ownership is as a big criteria now for, for development cooperation. And that means that agencies are happy to give budget support, not too happy, but a little happy to give budget support to low income countries. But we get very nervous when we do that, because what are they going to do with the money? So we, we need to fund research to understand better how these countries operate that we are supporting. And I think that because of this new Paris agenda, uh, aid agencies do invest in research. But what about the other side? 
the ownership side. What does that require? What does it require to shoulder ownership? Well, I think, of course, low-income countries need to understand their own conditions. They, of course, need to analyze options. And, of course, you need to understand global issues and not only looking at your own society. Low-income countries need to compare the trade policies of India and China and other countries. They need to understand everything that is acting upon them. And then, of course, you need to design strategies that you like yourself. You need to negotiate conditions for aid, conditions for trade, um, conditions for signing conventions, and all the other things. And you need to be able to evaluate that with scientific methodologies. And still, very, very few invest in research capacity in low-income countries. Since I'm standing here and having worked with Sweden, I must say that during the 10 years I have been working in SOREC and the 30 years that SOREC has been operating, it has been consciously trying to fund research in countries. Both development of strategies, of ma research management, of research training, of institutions, uh, and research grant mechanisms. And we also support regional research councils. And we have heard a lot about the importance here about the Latin American research councils and the African social science research councils. I'm talking about CLACSO and CODESRIA. And I don't know if I should be proud or ashamed to say that Scandinavian funding uh, is about half of those, or even more in some cases, of those research councils. But I'm ashamed to represent the aid community and say that there is so little other funding. Scandinavian countries are small countries in the world, and it's very dangerous for Latin American scholars and African scholars to depend on so few countries. So the major challenge is how come countries have not found ways of keeping their fragile research communities in better shape? And how come that we, the agencies, are so reluctant to fund research at the country level? I think it's obvious to us that uh, research communities need various levels. You need to have core funding of institutions. You need to have granting mechanisms. You need also to have ability to target funding, in some cases, for political interests and other interests. And you need to be able to collaborate across borders. If we look at those things, our aid could fund those two things a lot. But these things, who are funding that? And this will not create sustainable research communities unless you have these spaces. Is it difficult because we don't know what a good research community is and how it is composed? And this is why UNESCO has created and for 10 years run a particular forum which convenes research that are looking into systems and try to understand how these systems operate and try to produce advice uh, on such systems to decision makers and advisors. Ah. So maybe at the end, I think one could be slightly optimistic. I think it is possible to improve conditions both for using and producing social sciences and to create fair and sustainable development in all countries. But for that, we need to convince government and development cooperation agencies of various kinds to actually invest in viable long-term scientific communities. And with that, I'd like to thank you. And I'd also like to thank you all for having shared all your thoughts with us. It has been very delightful to be here. And since I'm the last speaker, I will actually take the privilege of thanking ISSC, of thanking University of Bergen and the city of Bergen, and particularly for those that ordered that beautiful weather. This is, a, this is indeed an enchanting city. It's worth walking around and it's worth visiting and I hope we can stay for a few more days because it's a lovely city. But thank you for the sunshine during the two days and for all the rich presentations. Thank you. So I think we can say at the end that really we can. United and supported by the critical social science, we can. We in Latin America,
we're trying to do our best, supported by uh, our strong critical social science and our strong social and political movement, we hope we are beginning to build the new world that is necessary and possible. So to our music farewell, I'm going to call Annelise Fem Wright, Chair of Local Organizing Committee, giving our thanks for her and by her to all the people responsible to organize the first World Social Science Forum. Thanks. <laughs>